Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, I welcome all of you on today's session. I am Professor Shahid Sarwar, Professor of Medicine and Gastroenterology at Imam Akbar Medical College. Uh, this session is primarily meant for postgraduate students as well as undergraduate students and family physicians, house officers who are likely to see medical emergencies and medical conditions in their daily practice. So let's start with today's uh, case and then we will build up on that. So today we are going to talk about a patient who is 40 years old and he has presented with epigastric pain, which is going on for the last six hours. Now, the first thing to think whenever you confront a patient is before taking history is to think of the possible differential diagnosis. So when we see a patient with epigastric pain, which has a short duration, there's a list of differential diagnosis that comes into our mind, depending, and, and it is based on the prevalence of these diseases, peptic ulcer disease, pancreatitis, cholecystitis, myocardial infarction, nautic dissection, appendicitis, even diseases like diabetic ketoacidosis, porphyria, they can present with severe epigastric pain. So there has to be number of points in history which we need to focus uh, while taking history from this particular patient. Obviously, we'll talk about severity, radiation, type of pain, its association with meal, fact of change of posture we know in relation to pancreatitis, why this question is important. Then the history of retrosternal discomfort and diaphoresis for somebody who's 40 years old uh, is, is meaningful. Similarly, we'll talk about there is previous history of similar pain or not. Is he diabetic or hypertensive? So all these things need to be explored in the history. What we see is that the pain is severe. It's continuous, non-radiating, and he hasn't taken anything uh, ever since for the last six hours since she, he's having the pain. There is no past history of food-related discomfort. He complains of diaphoresis, but there is no chest discomfort. He had vomited twice at home and has not passed any stool of fluidus for last six hours. There is no history of MSAIDs, any other medication, diabetes, hypertension. These are not there in this history. Once we did an examination, he's a middle-aged man with visible distress, with tachycardia, he has got positive postural hypertension, his pressures are on node side, and his respiratory rate is around 18. And on general physical, nothing else is positive. Dominant scaphoid, moving with the respiration, um, inverted implicus, but it is markedly tender in epigastrin and there is no shifting darkness and bowel sounds are also absent. And uh, what we can find on other examination of the other system is that there is reduced chest expansion on the left side, the stony down percussion on the left base uh, with absent breath sounds and reduced vocal resonance in the left base as well. Now, once we have taken the history, have done the examination, obviously we'll go back to the same differential diagnosis that the list that we created right at the start at the presentation of the patient. And you can conclude that because pain is epigastrium, it improves with sitting up, it is associated with vomiting, absolute constipation, and there is no history of diabetes, hypertension. So our differential will now be then narrowed down to the possibility of pancreatitis, cholecystitis, Due to his age and male gender, still the myocardial function will remain the possibility, despite the fact that the risk factors are not present in this patient. And you will not forget our aortic dissection, which can present with epigastric pain, with hypotension, with diaphoresis, with a very critical situation that needs not to be missed. Now, how should we proceed? And what test will we like to perform in next emergency? So this is the list that should come straight into your mind, CBC, ECG, ultrasound, myelase lipase, and excess chest. And if you go back to the differential diagnosis list that we had, you can very well understand why we have planned for these tests right away in the emergency. His ECG was done, which was perfectly okay. And we can see that there is homogeneous opacity in the left lower lung zone with loss of costophrenic and cardiophrenic angles, meaning that this is pleural effusion most likely on the left side. This is an ultrasound which was done, and you can see there is there is an opaque opacity uh, within the lumen of the gallbladder, which has got a shadow suggestive of stone in the gallbladder. Now, this is what his complete blood count and liver function test, the renal prof profile are showing. Oh, the noticeable thing is the raised TLC, mildly deranged LFTs, 
and ESR of around 40. But what pointed us toward the diagnosis is amylase and lipase. That is much, much, much higher than the normal value. So the lesson till this time to learn is that never miss this particular acute diagnosis and you will not get this diagnosis if you do not suspect pancreatitis in patients coming to emergency in epigastric pain. So that's the diagnosis. Uh, we all know pancreas is a very important organ which is lying between the C loop of the duodenum and it's got a lot of function related to uh, digestion of the food as well as obviously endocrine functions which are critical to the life. And we all know that once pancreas get inflamed due to any cause, what happens is that the enzymes which are in inactivated form within the pancreas, they get activated and they start digesting the pancreas itself. That's what leads to acute pancreatitis and that's what leads to the clinical manifestation of this particular disease. What can lead to the pancreatitis? We need to remember that the two major causes, either alcohol or stone in the common bile, the biliary pancreatitis. These are the two most common causes. Apart from that, there are less common causes, which we'll talk about. And then still a five to 10% of the patients will remain idiopathic, they will not find any cause. So 40 to 70 percent will find gallstones. And the importance of this is the once you are done and recovered out of acute pancreatitis, you need to refer this particular patient to the surgery. Alcoholic pancreatitis need a heavy consumption of alcohol over a period of time, at least for five years, more than 50 grams per day. Otherwise, the, the usual social intake of alcohol is not going to lead this complication. Then we have less common causes like hypertriglyceridemia, hypercalcemia, drugs, and malignancies as well. Few genetic disorders like pancreas division, annulus pancreas, they can also end up with acute pancreatitis. Then there's sphincter eye dysfunction. post ERCP pancreatitis is very typical. Around 5% of patients are going to develop. Then we have a relatively newer entity, the autoimmune pancreatitis. And if all is negative, we also need to go ahead with genetic testing because few uh, genetically transferred diseases can also predispose a person to the risk of acute pancreatitis like CFDR, sphinx gene, and trypsinogen, ketonic trypsinogen gene mutation. How do these patients present? The classical presentation is epigastric pain. It's present in, in almost all of the patients, but radiation to the back is a feature which only be seen in 50% of these uh, cases. And the history will be of hours to days, not of months. Then it may be associated with nausea, vomiting, distension, tenderness, restlessness, agitation, depending on the severity of the pancreatitis. On examination, you, the most important thing to note is the signs of dehydration, tenderness, and then there are a few uh, critical signs which, which points toward the gravity of disease like Gray Turner and Cullen sign. Bowel signs are mostly absent right at the start, and patients are likely to develop left-sided pleural fusion as we saw in the patient that we started our case with. This is Cullen sign and is a sign of hemorrhagic pancreatitis. It's a sign of a very severe pancreatitis. And this is how the gray turner signs looks like. Both are the signs of hemorrhagic pancreatitis. So how do we diagnose? Three out of the, these are the three parameters and two out of these three will make the diagnosis. Typical history, more than three times raised amylase and lipase. And the th third thing is imaging, characteristic findings on imaging. So if you can, if you can come up with two of these features, you can diagnose, label your patient as acute pancreatitis. A uh, word of caution about these amylase and lipase because they have some limitations. Obviously, uh, the amylase is the one which rises early, but settles early as well. And there are situations where it can be normal even with the pancreatitis and there are a long list of conditions which can lead to false positive raised amylase level. So whenever interpreting these results, always keep the possibilities of ischemic uh, and <clears throat> intestinal perforation, mesenteric ischemia, cholecystitis, and all these things can also lead to raised amylase. Lipase is much more specific, and obviously it has a longer half-life, but there are still the conditions which can lead to false rise in lipase levels. So it means clinical presentation, biochemical test, and if both are not positive, then I will need an evidence on imaging as well. And that imaging would mean the best thing to diagnose acute pancreatitis is CT scan. But you don't generally do it right at the start if you have good enough evidence in the form of clinical presentation and raised amylase lipase, then you don't do it right at the time of formation because it's mostly recommended after two to three days 
and is meant to detect necrotizing pancreatitis, complications of pancreatitis. So here you can see a cross-sectional image of the CT scan that, and you can see how the pancreas normally looks like because it's, it's a very smooth outline, homogeneous uh, density on the CT scan that you can see. And once the patient develops acute pancreatitis, uh, uh, either it is swollen, its size is larger, but it is enhancing and there is no necrosis, or it may look like this. Here you can see, despite being a contrast in a CT scan, the contrast is not being picked. It's a big hypodense area, which is showing the necrotizing pancreatitis. So CT is a very important and useful test for making diagnosis. MRI has its own place. There are a few advantages with MRI. It can pick a stone of more than three millimeter in CBD, which may be missed in CT scan. Then pancreatic duct abnormalities are better identified and delineated in the MRI. And thirdly, you can perform a T2 image to diagnose necrotizing pancreatitis without giving the contrast, uh, especially in a patient who had got renal insufficiency where giving contrast is not an option. So these are the situations where you may opt for MRI. So how do the patients of acute pancreatitis progress? Remember, majority of these patients are going to resolve by themselves. Maybe 90 to 95% patients are not going to develop any complication. They are going to settle by themselves. But there is a certain percentage, around 10%, 20%, who are going to have complications. And the initial complication, first 48 to 72 hours, which you worry about, is multi-organ failure. And the second complication is necrotizing pancreatitis. So their 10 to 20% patients are going to develop necrotizing pancreatitis. Even out of those necrotizing pancreatitis, still 60% of them are going to have steroid necrosis where it will settle itself and which has a very low mortality. The major thing that we really worry is either multi-organ failure right at the start or an infected necrosis because then it's a longer protracted clinical course that you may face in these patients and their mortality still remains around 15 to 25%. So you can understand majority of the patients are going to settle by themselves, but at start, you will have to treat every patient as a potential patient with necrotizing, with infected necrosis of the pancreas. And that's the only way of saving those 10, 20% patients who are likely to have complications. So a few terminologies, which we need to remember, interstitial pancreatitis, if there is no necrosis, and necrotizing pancreatitis if you have evidence of necrosis or imaging. Then if there is a fluid collection around the pancreas, less than four weeks, you will call it as acute peripancreatic collection. But if it goes beyond four weeks, you call it as pseudosis. Then if there is necrosis, initially you call it as acute necrotic collection. But beyond four weeks, it is called as walled off necrosis. So these terminologies need to be remembered because these are based on timelines. Another thing, I talked about multi-organ failure as this is the most lethal complication in initial 48 to 72 hours. That's how you define multi-organ failure. You can see it basically comprises of circulatory failure, respiratory failure, renal failure, or blood loss that is hemorrhagic pancreatitis more than 500 ml in 24 hours. If you get two out of this, this patient has multi-organ failure and you, it means that you are dealing with a critical patient who can end up with critical and <clears throat> grave outcome. Then another staging system that I that we all need to remember is Atlanta staging system. This basically is based on presence or absence of multi-organ failure and presence of uh, or absence of pancreatic necrosis. If both of these things are not there, then this pancreatitis is mild. If patient has multi-organ failure, but it has recovered within 48 hours and or, and or there is pancreatic necrosis, you will label it as moderate pancreatitis. But somebody with Multi-organ failure, which is going beyond 48 hours, this is a patient with severe pancreatitis. So there are different ways of staging that we've talked about, mild, moderate, severe, uh, edematous, or necrotizing, that these are the terminologies which should be used properly. But the limitation with the Atlanta score is that that needs 48 to 72 hours to decide that the patient has developed multi-organ failure or not, there is necrosis or not. But right at the time of admission in emergency, you need to make the CN that where should I take the patient? Should it be admitted in the general ward or in high dependency unit? Or he is a candidate for ICU care. So for that, this bicep score is much more helpful. It's, it's a basically mnemonic for raised blood urea nitrogen, impaired mental status, systemic inflammatory response syndrome, age more than 60, and plural effusion. If you have zero to one parameter, you can take it, manage it in the general ward. If it's two to three parameters, means high dependency unit. And more than three 
parameters means that the patient should be managed in ICU care because then the chances of mortality are much higher. And briefly, what is SIRS? You can see we all know this is systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Two out of these four features will be labeled as systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So just to summarize what I have talked about the progress, the progress of this particular disease is that initially at the time of admission, I will use my SAP score to decide how to manage this patient. But for first 48 hours, my main focus will remain the wideness of multi-organ failure because that's the lethal complication that patient can develop. Once beyond 48 hours and there is no multi-organ failure, then your focus will shift to the presence or absence of necrosis. That is important. And in, even in necrosis, it's the infected necrosis which worries us most because of its critical course, because of its higher mortality. And beyond four weeks, you will label either pseudocyst or walled off necrosis in case patient has developed this particular thing. So the timelines are important to remember while managing these patients. How should I manage? As any patient who is being critically admitted in emergency, airway, breathing, circulation, pain relief, and hydration. These are the primary things that you do for every patient. But the most important thing for acute pancreatitis is aggressive hydration right at the start, right from the start of admission. And you need to use crystalloids for that. Why? Because I'm trying to avoid problems in patients who are likely to develop, in fact, necrotizing pancreatitis, because in that case, patient can have severe dehydration, can have insuff circulatory insufficiency leading to multi organ failure because the fluid is being lost in the third space in vomiting, in diaphoresis, in inflammation. So the, if you ask me one important thing regarding the management, it's a aggressive hydration of the patient with the monitoring of his intake output and all those things, because this is what is going to save you from a very difficult, long protracted course of illness in patients with pancreatitis. Then there are a few things which are stressed more early. High, nutrition is, is stressed in patients with acute pancreatitis. If patients' bowel sounds have returned and his passing flatters, you will start with the liquids and will build that up as, as per the tolerance of the patient. But in situations where patients' ileus is not settling, his bowel sounds are returning, people have used nasogastric or nasal tubes to start entering pressure. The concept behind is very simple that because it is, it is felt that the nutrition of the, uh, of the intestinal epithelium is dependent on whatever we are taking orally. And once you make patients nothing per oral, then this epithelial lining uh, starts getting damaged and there is more risk of translocation of infection from the gut into the third space, into the outside where necrotizing pancreatitis, in case it is necrotizing, will get infected. So there is a lot of evidence to suggest that if you start an early entry nutrition for these patients, there are less likely, less chances of developing infected necrosis. That's why this, this thing is stressed so much that patients should be started on entry nutrition as early as possible. And obviously you are going to monitor that patient for multi-organ failure, respiratory failure, circulatory, and all these with your routine lab tests. Should I use antibiotics? No, it is strongly discouraged. And uh, fever, ITLC, in initial part of the pancreatitis is a part is, is, is an evidence of inflammation. It's not evidence of infection. It is only used in patients who have developed infected necrosis, not even in sterile necrosis. So how will, how will I determine that? That's, that will be based on clinical progress of the patient. If he is, his high grade fever is persistent, his TLC count is rising, his bowel sounds are not returning, abdomen is, uh, is, is uh, tender and obviously distended and you find necrosis on CT scan, you should start suspecting that this necrosis is probably infected. And in that case, you need to aspirate, you need to take sample from that, send it for culture, and then you can start for the antibiotic. So the, the first most important thing to remember in management is aggressive hydration. The second most important thing is the avoidance <clears throat> of antibiotics that we need to do the third most important thing that I have already talked about is early entry nutrition that needs to be taken care of in the patients of acute pancreatitis. If, if we need to use antibiotics, which antibiotics? Obviously, group is the drug of choice. The other options are quinolones and metronidazole. Do I need to perform ERCP urgently in patients with acute pancreatitis? The only urgent indication for urgent ERCP is 
presence of stone, evidence of stone in CBD with evidence of cholangitis. In that case, you have to perform an uh, urgent ERCP. Otherwise, if you find a stone and there is no evidence of cholangitis, you may wait for a few days till settling the patient's condition. And then you have, you have to remove that stone, but obviously in that case, you can wait. So just to give you an idea how to handle a, necro a pancreatic necrosis, because if somebody ha has necrosis and you are suspecting infection based on his clinical condition, his TLC count and uh, the progress of the disease, then you will have to get a CT guided FMAC. If it is sterile, you will wait and you may repeat this particular fine needle aspiration after five to seven days if the patient is still not improving. If it is infected, you have to start with antibiotics and aggressive antibiotics with all the rest of the management, supportive care and uh, avoidance of multi organ failure that we need to do. And if patient still fails to settle, then comes the role of surgery in these patients of necrotizing pancreatitis. Few slide, that's one slide just to show how to handle this infected necrosis or pseudocyst. These are the two complications which are associated with pancreatitis. They can be very well managed with endoscopic ultrasound, guided drainage and stenting and relief. And this is something which will, uh, which will, which will avoid interventions and surgeries and like that. So the indication for surgery is where there is failure to improve with antibiotics in a patient with infected necrosis and drainage of pseudocyst, it is pseudocyst if it is not possible endoscopically. And obviously you will have to go for cholecystectomy in somebody who has got biliary pancreatitis or somebody with pancreatitis and evidence of CBD of gallstones should have cholecystectomy to avoid recurrence of pancreatitis. Once the patient has recovered, never forget to work up for underlying etiology and prevention. We have already talked about the possible causes like stones, alcohol, hypertrichosidemia, hypercalcemia, drugs, and then not immune pancreatitis. This needs to be worked up and have, <clears throat> then we will treat the underlying whatever cause we identify for acute pancreatitis. So in summary, acute medical emergency, most uh, it's an acute medical emergency and the most common cause is either gallstones or alcoholism. Diagnosis needs clinical history, raised amylase lipase, or imaging evidence of pancreatitis on imaging studies. Management is focused on pain relief, good hydration, and antibiotics if indicated for these patients. End organ failure and infected necrosis are the major complications that you may find in the patients affected with pancreatitis. Thank you very much.